There's a reason Kenny Beats is one of the great young producers in hip hop. Because he does his homework. Kenny has a vast understanding of the regional sounds and histories of cities to pull from when making beats for an artist. This allows him to find a common musical language with rappers, which gives him a leg up in an art form as hyper-local as rap. Everything from the popular local dances to the type of crime most prevalent in different cities can inform the sound of a local scene and influences how Kenny might approach making a beat. Today, we're kicking off a two-part series of interviews with Kenny Beats. And the one you're about to hear, which was taped a while back, Kenny maps out the evolution of regional sounds in hip hop, drawing parallels between disparate cities. And how hip hop has evolved from creating beats out of old drum samples, known as break beats, to sampling and referencing itself. I should also say that Kenny produced our theme song, the one you're about to hear, as if he were Rick Rubin in 1985. See if you can guess which Beastie Boys song it's based on. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Here's Rick Rubin and Kenny Beats at Shangri-La. What's a good What's a good place to start? Well, really, like, first off, everything that you and I have talked about when it comes to regional hip hop and these things, I'm talking about such a short time period. Yes, I was born in '91, so I'm really thinking a little bit before when I was born, and then how that came into all the stuff I grew up with, and then all the stuff I'm actually working in now, and what that was routed in. But oftentimes, like. Most of the parallels I'm finding between two cities or two artists or influence going on in the radio now or even on like a street level, it doesn't go back as far as like hip hop's roots go back. You know what I mean? When I talk about like all the connections between Memphis and Atlanta and all the connections between uh, Detroit and the Bay Area or even like Florida and New Orleans, the real like common denominator for me all started by the time like drum machines and 808s were introduced and those kinds of things. So I'm not even thinking back as far as like when boom bap hit any of these cities or G funk or even that it's just the conversation starts there. Yes. You know? And like, I think it's just so interesting how like there was like the first big rapper like signed coming out of Detroit that people always talk about was this dude named Robert S got signed in like 1985. And that was like, very reminiscent of like Brooklyn hip hop and like, you know what I mean? Like New York kind of stuff. But like the common conversation with Detroit is always Eminem, Kid Rock, Danny Brown, Big Sean. Like those are the the people like on the Mount Rushmore of big commercial hip hop in Detroit that comes to everyone's minds. Mm -hmm. But what's going on on a street level there right now is so different than any of those four big artists. And it all started from what I understand with like artists like Dex Osama and artists like uh, Team Eastside and uh, what was Dex's group and the uh, Choppa Boys. And like I can play an example. Yeah. Right now, the, the easiest parallel to always draw with people is Detroit in the Bay. It's all really fast. When people talk about Bay Area music, they really do think of like a mustard beat or they think of like these kind of like swung G funk influenced. You know what I mean? Kinds of uh, production and raps and stuff. And Detroit, to me, is what all the people in the Bay are always talking about and listening to when I'm talking to those artists. And the first time you hear what I think of is like the current style that goes on in that city and where all those kids draw from, the forefather is from the late 90s. You know what I mean? It's, it doesn't go back decades and decades. Yeah. And like when you hear Dex's stuff, you hear – big reverby pianos, like pizzicato strings and acid bass lines. It's always these don't, 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 don't. Play some, play some. My mama said I got death on me. Death on me. The reason why I got this vest on me, yeah. These niggas want me, then come get me. I ain't hiding, nigga, I'm in the city. I'm in the city. So you can hear like it kind of sounds like the beats were being made with like the stock string sound, the stock piano sound, the stock bass sound they had. But when I listen to it, it's very often an early like Detroit rap in this subgenre of it, an acid bass. Wow, 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 like the same similar kind of bass sound. And Detroit is also known for fathering techno. And there's a lot of those same sound palettes used. 
So in my mind, I'm like, okay, somebody learned how to make music in Detroit around people who were familiar with these certain synthesizers, these certain drum machines or whatever. But what was resonating where they were from wasn't four on the floor drums, wasn't techno, wasn't this. It was different kinds of patterns, different kinds of beats. They were probably listening to stuff from other cities. So when they go to do a hi-hat pattern on a TR-808 or they go do a bass line on an old Juno or whatever it is, they're emulating the melodies and the drum patterns and everything of hip hop, but they're using techno sounds, really, if you look at it. And I think that's where like the early Detroit sound came from. The tempo and everything got updated by what kids were listening to and this and that, but it really was from Detroit techno elements. And when you listen to the the biggest rappers in Detroit right now, who if you go to a party in Detroit and play these songs, like the entire room knows every word, if even if they have no hook, you hear such similar elements. And the producer today, who I think everyone considers just the godfather of the current Detroit sound, is hell of a. And when you listen to some of the hottest stuff going on out of the Bay or like artists like g Easy, you know what I mean? Or artists like that are coming out of LA right now. A lot of their s- sound is informed by these tempos, these kinds of kick patterns, these drum patterns. And I think when you look at Mustard and you look at like how he took over radio in 2012 with these big baseline 100 BPM beats, this and that, I think it's a combination of like these Detroit and Bay sister city like kinds of styles of beat making and rap but at the same time the producers he grew up listening to probably weren't the guys making these beats in detroit he was probably listening to battle cat and he was probably listening to dj quick and he was probably listening to la music where the sound choice is different and the bounce is different so like when you talk about g-funk or you talk about like legendary la and bay producers like it's much more swung and much more funky you know what I mean? And it's a much different kind of attitude than the Detroit shit. Just like being in the Motor City is a way different attitude than being in the Bay. And so I think they were inspired by each other. But Mustard was going to use a softer, rounder bass sound instead of that acid bass because it might be a little more smooth. But he's still going to keep it at 100 BPM. It, it, the only this the, like, the only difference is sound choice to me, really. A little bit of tempo, a little bit of sound choice, but it's essentially the same vibe and you're getting across like the same kind of feeling. And you listen to like, like even in other huge mustard songs, like uh, Be Honest for Kid Ink, like you hear the piano influence and you hear other things that are very Detroit. <laughs> It's just he opts for the snaps and the no hats and the chill little like like the little chants and extra percussion and hat rolls rather than the really strict, fast, you know what I mean, mm-hmm. hats and percussion and this and that. But it's similar sound choice too. You hear those same like uh, chant sounds and same rim rolls and everything in both the beats. It's just a matter of like swing, bounce, mustard's a little behind the beat. Where I feel like Detroit stuff's either strictly quantized or, if anything, a little ahead. Do you think that um, the local drug choice makes a difference in the tempos and the hundred percent? It's it's got to. I mean, if you look at the Bay, like one of the biggest movements ever out of the Bay is a hyphy movement, and if you look at Mac Dre and Keek the Sneak and all those kinds of guys, like it was very informed by Molly. You know what I mean? And like by the drugs that they were doing and stuff. And in Detroit. I mean, it's not necessarily drugs, but the type of crime and the type of things that go on there, prostitution mainly and the different types of drugs, like much more harder stuff from what I understand that gets sold in Detroit way more prevalently is that's talked about in the music way more. You know what I mean? And from what I understand, the Bay Area and Detroit have that in common with prostitution and things like that. But you hear about different kinds of things because this music is getting made on a street level and they're just talking about what they know in that city. And that's what gets the biggest reaction is the people who are being the most authentic and the most honest and the most regional. They're talking about things that specifically, you know, this neighborhood, like when you talk about new Orleans bounce music, Mm -hmm. one of the characteristics of bounce music is call and response from day one with a big Frida and Magnolia shorty and those kinds of people. Like it was always about getting the audience to respond to something that you were saying, even in the beats, like it would be, there'd be these big chants and play something. Bounce it, 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 bounce it
Like, let me see you bounce it. Let me see you bounce it. Let yeah, me see you. The energy's incredible. Man. Yeah, and it's so high up. And and the whole genre of, of of bounce music is based in two or three drum samples. If you ask anyone who knows anything about bounce music, they'll tell you the Trigger Man uh, drum loop is what basically the whole genre was created off of. And if you look up just the Trigger Man, it's by the original record is the Showboys. Everyone knows this. The whole genre is based in that. And it's like that that one break created this whole thing. And it's from drum machines. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not a James Brown thing. It's yeah. not an old meters like loop. It's someone played those 808 rims yes. and then sampled that and 40 other songs. Yes. And it created a tempo and a vibe and this and that. But like when you see the like the call and response thing that goes on in bounce music turn into cash money and no limit and artists like juvenile are credited being at the start of dance music. And then they turn into like crunk music from there. And then you see little John all of a sudden be influenced by these big call and response chain. If you say, we like everything he was saying was always like for the crowd, like to the windows, to the walls. Like it's very new Orleans bounce. You know what I mean? And all, even if you look at like, the influence on Memphis to crunk music and Little John. Like, there's so many different parallels there. And at this point, when you trace back the, either the artists I'm working with or the artists I'm big fans of, I'm not always like, oh, this goes back to this old DJ Premier record and that was sampled from this James Brown record. Because I feel like so much of hip hop is like that. But now we're so far along that it's like, I'm tracing it back to people sampling something off an ASR or, you know, an MPC. And that only goes back to the early nineties, late eighties, you know, like G easy and Cardi B have a current song out. I think it's called no limit. Let me play it. It's the, it's a sample of slob of my knob by three, six mafia. They redo the, the flow. There's things about the beat. That are really similar. Late on the bed and give me head. Don't have to ask, don't have to beg. Memphis, super Memphis, like MPCs, TR 808s, super simple patterns, but like ASAP Ferg's biggest song last year. Ride with the mob, hum do Allah, check in with me and do your job. Ferg is the name, Pimbola did the chain, Tono for the watch. So, and that's a huge New York artist and then a huge Bay Area artist and, and Cardi, also a New York artist, all being influenced by an old song from Memphis and 3-6 Mafia were known for slowing down the Trigger Man break that came from New Orleans. They all tie in yeah, in, in a weird way. So, like... This has been something for me that's just been such a phenomenon in the last few years because I stopped making hip hop for a while and I came back to it and was so scared that my card would get pulled of not understanding, you know what I mean, a certain thing that's going on in a city or the lineage of it and or how to make it or the sound choice. And so I would get stuck in these little pockets of being like, okay, I'm working with this kid right now from uh, Baltimore. I need to understand more about what goes on there in the rap scene, in the dance music scene, what kind of dances come from there, what kind of attitude the people have from there and why the type of crime it's on in the city. It's like all these things inform the conversation of what my hi-hat pattern is going to be when I get there that day. And it's sometimes something that small that gets the person to get on the record and do their thing or not, because you're assuming like, oh, let me just let me clean that up. That snare is a little ahead of the beat. Let me just quantize that for you and then do a similar beat to your last single. And then guys get there and they're like, nah, this doesn't feel right. And it's not always even the volume in the studio or the sound choice or anything like that. It doesn't rhythmically hit where they're used to it hitting in their head when they think about home and they think about the process of making music that they started with in their basement with their friends. And it probably affects their comfort level in their in the way the rhyme works. It's like 
if you're used to a certain bounce and writing to a certain bounce and a comfort level, it's harder to it's harder to channel that yeah. if it's bouncing different, 100%. even if the tempo's the same. And I think guys assume that they're being a, a good engineer or a friend to the artist or the song by trying to clean something up with an EQ or trying to put it on beat or trying to make it relate to something that they think is working right now on the radio or for another artist, blah, blah, blah. And, and that's where you lose everything. And for me, it's like, understanding when a new artist comes to the studio from New Orleans that it's not always a conversation of like, oh, do you understand the Trigger Man break and how bounce music started? It's not that, but it informs where they're from, what they grew up on. Maybe they lean towards these kinds of tempos. Maybe they lean toward these rhythms. Maybe not, but it's... In in each case, to learn about them, did you have to go to the places? I haven't been to a lot of the places I've wanted to, but a lot of times I'd been to these places before I learned more about because I traveled as a DJ for years. I've been to 40 something states playing shows, but then came back into hip hop and working with all these different artists a lot of the time in LA. And it was kind of like getting schooled about these places that, yeah, I've been there. Oh yeah, I know about this neighborhood and this restaurant and so forth and so on. But did I ever apply any of that knowledge of what I'd even seen in my life to the music? No, not before someone was right in front of me and was saying to me like, "Ah, this is how we do it. Like it's supposed, that's supposed to be what's wrong to you. That's right to us. And now like that's paramount for me. So it still wouldn't be what you make, wouldn't really follow a template. You'd you'd use this information as a, it's like a menu of things to pick from because you don't want to make the same record someone else made. Never. But it's basically... A lot of the time, the job, I feel like, of the producer in the studio should be just to give the vocabulary to the artist of, so they can get out their idea better. Yes. You're trying to show them, okay, maybe you want to try this vocal effect or you want to try this instrument or you want to try this variation of this instrument. For me, it was giving me a vocabulary to understand what they're doing. You know what I mean? Like, Because a lot of times I'm always helping. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and like... This is the artist helping me to just come into their world. Even if we don't use that lesson today, a decision I make or a sound choice or whatever is going to be just informed by the conversation of, oh, like you make music from Memphis. You know, and I work on a lot of rap. So like we were saying with the bounce music, shouting out where you're from, who you are, what you stand for is a quintessential like cornerstone of a lot of the artists I work with, where they're from is who they are. In my mind, I'm like, okay, would an ode to where you come from as far as the tempo or a sample or the sound choice set it off when you play this live in your hometown? I think it would. Yeah. And like, those are the moments where this becomes a tool where you're like, so oh my where, God. It's where the DJ mentality brought into production really helps. 100%. Is because you're, you're th- always thinking about what's going to rock the club. But isn't that what you would say when you used to talk about the first records on Def Jam is that the rap records that were coming out didn't reflect how it felt when you went to a rap show. You would hear all this scratching and all this mic work and all these things. And like, that's what brought those songs to life. I think with people now, like whenever that break beat or trigger man sample or old vocal thing or something from your childhood or that place that makes you think of somewhere comes into a new song now with an updated type of beat or drum sound or tempo or whatever it is, it already like sets such a strong platform and foundation for like this song to reach a lot of people and make them feel a lot. You know what I mean? Cause it's, yeah. it's routed in like, Oh, this is an experience. Yeah. A lot of these producers that created these waves and these sounds, whether it was what they were playing or their sampling or whatever, I think they're shocked now that, a lot of times in hip hop, the music serves like a bed behind these huge drums. And it's not these samples right in the front of these big melodies or keyboards things. It's like there's kids who are so influenced by crunk music and by Three Six Mafia and by all these things that now it's like the drums and the swing of the drums and the sounds of the drums are the biggest thing in so many records. And you end up with artists like Splurge and 10K and kids from Texas who just rap on 808s. Do you want to play some? Sure. Splurge is from Arlington, and these kids just rap on just drums. Yeah. 
Ay, ay, play with that young and that nigga gon' bomb. Run out that shack, get that shit to my mom. Hell, Hell deal with the fashion, this shit came from Tom. I came from the mud, this shit took some time. I remember the Drake and serve it like he blind. Put this in your bitch, that little bitch be crying. I still go to the pet like a press. This is so good. He's in every single label meeting, everything he could be in, telling them no melodies, no hooks. It's so good. His mixtape was called No Melody. <laughs> the name of the tape. Like, they are the most quintessential example of, like, just getting it how you live, making what sounds good to your friends where they are. And I think it was it's with Splurge, like, he's to the point now where if he doesn't just hear something big and hard and instinctual and powerful that everybody in the room goes, ugh, he doesn't even want it. And that's what I was saying about the good and bad parts of that in hip hop is like, it informs people in a certain respect of like, okay, we know this is going to work at the club and we know that this is going to go off in this region. Kids from around here are going to rock with how this song is moving because it, just feeds into what we all know and what we all collectively, like the zeitgeist of of this area. Like, it's crazy when you see artists who are very much from somewhere and act like it and look like it and have the same slang and accent or whatever, but their music just sounds like somewhere else, very specifically. Even like kids like Shoreline Mafia who are from LA and very big in LA, people always talk about how bay their music is. And yeah, it's within a, it's a state, but it's two completely different scenes and sounds. And I mean, New York is really kind of an outlier too, I feel like. Even today, like, I think New York, a lot of young, hot New York artists hate the fact that when people talk about New York beats, they think of boom, bat, 90 BPM. They think of Wu-Tang type rhythms and beats. And you know what I mean? They think of Alchemist beats. They think of Mob Deep. But if you look at, the newest, biggest songs from there. If you look at all six nines music, it's the same. It's in the nineties. It's all 90, 95. If you look at Bobby Shmurda, his biggest song ever, hot boy. Like it was literally boom, bap, DJ premier, New York city, rap music tempo. It's these, it's these kinds of things you're hearing now and, and drill music and in new Atlanta music. Examples of the New York. Yeah. Let's play like a classic one. A whole different swing, completely different. Yeah. This is the first thing you played that sounds like it's rooted in a breakbeat feel. Totally, and but that's that's classic New York. I think when people think New York, that's what they think of. And then you look at like. The biggest artist from New York now, like Gummo actually wasn't even in the 90s as far as BPM range, but a lot of 6 nines music works in the same tempos. It's so fast. That just sounds like a descendant of Crunk, though. Totally. Yeah. But this is New York rap now. Interesting. And like Bobby Shmurda. Do you remember when you first heard Crunk? Yeah, I was like eight. Did so. it blow your mind? Because it, it destroyed me when I heard I loved it. I remember hearing like Young Bloods and Yin Yang Twins and hearing Little John's production first and just being like, in awe of how simple and hard it was. Yeah. And just being like, like, remember the Whisper song by Yang Yang Twins? Doom, doom, doom. Play it. Doom, doom, <laughs> doom. Oh my, let me find it. Hey, how you doing, little mama? Let me whisper in your ear. Tell you something that you might like, dear. You. you think about it, though, this was a hit. It's so cool. And they're not too far away from what Splurge is doing now. It's an 808 and a snap. Yeah. Splurge is an 808. Play, play a splurge. Hey, let me hear that hard job. Yeah. the intro part two. Super distorted and like super new with the sound choice, but it's still just drums yeah. and it's focused on the flow. And now they call it ASMR, but I feel like with like the whisper song, hey, how you doing, little mom? All that extra mouth noise and everything you hear is what makes it so interesting on such a simple beat. And with splurge, they record it in the middle of a room with all his friends and you hear all this room noise and extra stuff. And he also raps really quiet and really in front of the mic, similar in palette, you know? And 
songs like uh, The Motto by Drake, like huge hit with Lil Wayne. I'm the fucking man. Y'all don't get it, do you? Type of money, everybody acting like they know you. Just like the Whisper song, though, with a three note 808 bass line, clap, snares, hats. That's Bay tempo. Yeah. It's very Bay area in the bounce of it. But it's like, it shows like in Texas. In Texas and in Atlanta and in the Bay Area, necessarily like the same sound choice, you know what I mean? Three or four ideas with the bounce of that respective city. Yes. The tempo of that respective city. Yes. It, it's it's that instinctual and elemental. It's like we can talk about how certain instruments work better in certain parts of the country or certain people respond to horns more in New Orleans and Atlanta than where they respond to pianos and strings in the Midwest. Like, I think the tempo and the bounce, the bounce and the swing of the records are like the two things that really make the biggest difference in every part of the country. Because if you can get it down to just a bass sound and a clap or something in the 2-4, but just changed 100 BPM over here. Diff the kick hits a little different in the pattern. 130 BPM over here, and then 150 over here. It's like, it's really about how people feel and how it moves them. And maybe the drugs of the city or where uh, people party in that respective city or how they party or whatever has something to do with that. But at the same time, it's like, there's we've already seen just in this conversation how many things trace back to how many other things the cities that believe in the music and in the hip hop and see it as a business are the ones where the sound finally takes precedent and it's not always where it originated yeah i've heard people talk about that with memphis but if people in memphis uh had the belief in the business of hip hop that they did in atlanta crunk music would have started in memphis first or, or certain other, let's say just any kind of niche trend thing could have popped off in the city where they created it rather than somewhere like the Bay or a, a guy like DJ Mustard sees, oh, this has the potential to be. That's what that's what the great artists have always done, though. The great artists have recognized the um, the local scenes where something's being made that's really cool, but it's really only for there. And they can take the DNA of that and make it into something that becomes national. Totally. And it's always been, or, or global. And that's always been, it's always been that way. It's always been, um, even in rock and roll, you know, it's always been like hearing, hearing something and then amplifying it in a new way. And it gets, you know, it's like with Led Zeppelin and the blues, you know, like, yeah. like the, it, it had to cross, it had to cross the Atlantic to get that blown up totally. because anyone any self-respecting blues artist wouldn't play music that was it'd be like ridiculous yeah but that's what made it international was that it like uh so and also sometimes this is interesting too that sometimes the misunderstanding of something that you like mm -hmm. forces you to make something that you think you're making something like what you heard and then it comes out completely different just totally. because you're you're hearing it different or you don't know how to make that yeah. stuff and you're just trying to guess it and you end up with a third thing. Yeah, which yeah. is also great. It's totally. like a lot of great stuff happens that way. It was like kind of aiming for one thing and getting something completely different. We'll be right back with Kenny Beats after a quick break. We're back with Rick Rubin and Kenny Beats. I think seeing this part of the matrix is one of my biggest strengths in any room with people making music. Because especially if I'm in like a very stuffy room with a lot of top shelf people who are doing very big things and trying to preemptively figure out what's going to work really well for their fan base or whatever. When you come in a room like that and you play like a kid like Tisa Korean, for example, who is actually now on the new Chance the Rapper single. But like Tisa months ago was just making funny music. Dick, then a bitch. Walk inside the spot and we wide then a bitch. Again, from Texas, just drums, 20-year-old kid who's really popping there right now, invented a bunch of dance crazes and stuff. If I play a Tisa Korean video in a room I'm in with all these really stressed out, really popping people, instantly it just lightens up the vibe. Because now we're not like, oh, what's the perfect chord change? It's like, oh, this kid's funny. 
like, oh, this song is just some big 808s and this kid's rapping super crazy and they're all dancing wild in the video. Instantly, everyone's watching the screen and now it's like, oh, this kid's funny. Imagine we did something like this. Imagine we tried that tempo. And it's a joke at first. Yeah. And it's like, oh, well, like this, this is an extreme example because Tisa's so off the wall, but Chance saw this kid somewhere and was like, I just love his energy. Let me harness it. Let me see what works about his music that I could apply. And the first single from Chance's long-awaited album is featuring Tisa Korean. Incredible. And they dropped it on Triller, the dance app, before streaming services. Because Tisa's so popping in that world that every little young kid dances to his songs. But you see how, like, being aware of these cool, small, regional things, like, almost help re-inspire the people who are the best at it. But this is coming from such a place of just like honesty and like we literally one an artist I'm working with right now records all his songs in the garage band on his Apple microphone on his computer and uses all garage band loops. You wanna play some of his? I'm sure his booba savage. Yeah. How old is he? Uba is 12 years old <laughs> from Cortland Ave in the Bronx. Lil Uzi's working with him. A Boogie's working with him. All these huge artists are a fan of him because he just says whatever he wants. But when you put on the Booba video in the serious session, kids go, is that a 12-year-old kid <laughs> rapping about, I'll make you disappear like magic? You're like, <laughs> you know, and, then, and, and instantly they start doing what you're doing. We start laughing. It starts being it's funny. so funny. And then, like... I was with a, uh, a female artist the other day who a lot of her music is just very cute. And she heard that piano loop and she's like, oh my God, I love this. And then I pulled up a bunch of xylophones. We started working with xylophones and we made a real song, you know? And so like, that's why I focus so hard on these things because these, this is what's inspiring me. It's not getting in the room with like the biggest genius ever of all time and them showing me how to make a record to reach a billion people. It's what's happening in this small, small corner of the country that makes those people from that part of the country erupt in a different way than the fans of the biggest artists ever. Like when something's for you, from you, by you, you know what I mean? Where you grew up, like a party in the Bay with all Bay artists with 200 people in a basement is an uncomparable energy to me. And like people who play big shows, there's always the conversation of like, would you rather play for 20,000 people or 200 of your best fans in the world in this one room and like it's clearly going to be better than with with the 200 yeah. people i mean for sure i think the latter is always it and that's how i look at this it's like i'm i, I never choose an artist i'm working with because of they're young and popping or because they, they have a certain wave anywhere i just like what i like yeah. and like giving context to people is my number one goal is like just helping someone understand why this is so cool where it is and why I latched onto it, even though I'm not from there and might not fully get it. Yeah. When you can have an artist like G-Eazy and Cardi B and ASAP Rocky put out a song like No Limit and then kids figure out that that's Slob of My Knob and all of a sudden they're listening to 3-6 Mafia, it's like, that's so cool to me. Yeah. You know, I, I love that because it just, rap's already become one of the biggest genres in the world. You know what I mean? Like from the time that you started Def Jam, all the way to right now, it's like, I don't know if anyone ever saw this. Like it's- Nobody did. It's insane. Nobody did. But I think it's so much And there were so of, many waves of it, dis like feeling like it was going away, like totally. over and over again. It's, it's, it's because of what we're talking about though. I think that's why rap has become as big as it's become is because it's just like, it transports you, whatever artist you're listening to, it transports you to where they're from and how they grew up and- even if now they're gigantic, whenever they started, their first music is always the truest, most authentic storytelling you can find in music for me right now. You know what I mean? I love to hear the stories of all these different places. And for me to try to help add to those stories without really doing my due diligence, yes, I think that would be misguided. And I think I'd be hurting more than I'd be helping. It's crazy. Do you, do you that have any theories on why, um, why Miami-based music was so particular there like it, it when everyone in the country was was going slow yeah they were always fast it was always cocaine 
I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It just always was fast. I'm like, I'm not a Miami go, guy. Like, but when, going from New York and listening, going to a hip hop club in New York to a hip hop club in Miami, every song would be different. You would n- n- not one of the same songs would play in the two cities. Yeah, I mean, does it has to do with the street life? It has to do with how fast paced Miami is and how much money there is there and how new the development was going at the time. It's like I just think that. Cities. I've always not liked Miami because it's all Lambos and beautiful girls in gowns and all this money and all this stuff. It's like the music must have lended itself to the scene in some type of way where people realize the faster we go, the more reaction we're getting out of people. But a lot of stuff that went on in Miami Bay slowed down is juke or is bounce or is Baltimore club or is whatever. It's same breaks, same yeah, sample. Play, play a juke sample. feels very two live crew in the sound choice and in the sample choice and then you listen to two live crew but that still sounded more like disco-y like more four on the floor four like, on the floor Mammy bass was not really like that but the tempo was like that. it was just fast yeah she's all rooted in planet rock yeah for sure it is but again it's drum machines you know what i mean there's no breaks it's like a very electronic thing in the scope of hip-hop yeah i had a discussion with a a friend the other day who was talking about that in today's world the sound is considered part of the writing so in other words if you were if you were called in as a producer and you changed the snare sound from the existing snare without changing the pattern if you just replaced the existing snare sound in the track with a different sound that you would be a writer of the song. Is that the case? Um, from what I understand, yes. That's, I'm, that's would, wild. Would never me. name names, but yeah. I had a good friend of mine who was signed to a very big producer, and his contract with that producer was, if you drop a song completely produced and written and everything by you and the people involved, he gets 15% of it, just as you being signed to him. And if he adds one thing... To that beat or anything at all, if he touches it and programs on it, he's taking 80% of the song. And what he would do was just basically just like take the MIDI of a hi-hat pattern and change the hi-hat sound. And then all of a sudden he's involved and now he owns it, all of your share. That is wild. Yeah. Try to keep my friends from signing any of those kind of contracts. <laughs> but, wild. but it is it is like that these days because sound choice is so paramount. When you think about a song like Grinding, you know, by Pharrell a long time ago, but literally it's just drums you know what i mean like like a lot of stuff we talked about today it's really like just this big instinctual kind of rhythm and so if someone changes yo yo i go by the name i'm a pharrell from the neptunes if someone changes that clap that's 20 percent of the beat <laughs> it is what it is it's like amazing. the for the uh, example i was saying before about like Samples this for out this we do this in our sleep, nigga. That little A that Pharrell used to use all the time. It's from the Triton keyboard. The most popular keyboard in hip hop in like the early 2000s It's just a sound on the Triton. Mm-hmm. So it's Yamaha. It's mm-hmm. not owned by Pharrell, even though we've heard it in clip songs, Snoop Dogg songs, NERD songs, Rihanna songs, all types of gigantic Neptune's production, because it was just a key piece of perk for them that they use all the time percussion. Like to me, it, I, I, I got it. I got my hands on it a while ago. And when someone asked me, like, like Vin, I remember working on a Vince Staples album, he would say, like, I want something that feels kind of Neptunesy, but I don't want to like take from it or I don't want to use the same patterns. And I was like, man, like. If I could just get the A eh from some of the Pharrell <laughs> stuff, it immediately puts you back to Neptunes, mm-hmm. back to Timbo era. And so I found it, and then I found out it was from a keyboard. And I'm like, okay, Pharrell doesn't own this, and I can't get in trouble for sampling this, but it's a Pharrell sound. Yeah. You know what I mean? As far as I'm concerned. Or like even uh when you go back and listen to like the chant that's in the ah, that's in like every mustard beat, every juicy J thing, like every it's it doesn't even trace back to a break. It traced back to, to like a, uh, what was it? It's like, 
house beats and loops like volume three like I think, it's, I think the original is yellow yellow y-e-l-l-o is it a song no it's a group from england like a electronic group from the 80s but there's they like, had the sound it's just the it's just the chant i can't remember what song it is so i can't i can't tell you <laughs> it's been a while home on the mustard but but you hear it and everything from California and everything from Detroit and a lot of old Southern stuff. You hear the chant on the offbeat and Lil John beats and stuff like that. And it's like, man, that's a classic sound in hip hop. But you get worried. You're like, man, I've heard it in so much stuff. If I sample it, am I in trouble? And sometimes it's like hard to find the lineage of these sounds. And now that so much of these beats is made up in the sound choice, you got to be careful. Like the main standpoint is I don't want this song to not come out because this is a kick that they can trace back to a record that I might be sampling or like an 808 that might be stolen. And then due to the user license agreement from the website I bought the 808 from, this is technically not my copyright. Like there's all kinds of weird little things like that. Sounds are the name of the game now. It's not really records, but like the metadata and all these sounds exists. And I don't know, like for, for me, I like really pride myself on hoarding sounds and just having <laughs> terabytes and terabytes and hard drives and hard drives of just sounds. And the more I can learn about like the lineage of them, easier it is for me to use them and apply them. We'll be back with Kenny Beats after a quick break. We're back with the rest of Rick's conversation with Kenny Beats. Do you ever see there being an evolution lyrically in hip hop of it not being, not all being so similar in content? <laughs> I don't find it to be. Really? No. Yeah. The amount of stuff, the amount of people I work with, it's every day, if I have, say I have two sessions a day for a whole week, I probably got five, six perspectives that don't understand each other. Yeah. For sure. And like I have, rat, like nowadays, it's even harder now because I'd never base something on a personality or like anything other than the music. I'm like, if I love this music, I want to help this person to work on it. Yeah. And then I start working with them and I realize like, oh, your past is troubled and your like industry business stuff is all messed up and this and that. And I don't always do my research, but a lot of times like whoever I get in with, I need to figure out how to understand their perspective quickly. And if I only had two or three perspectives or contents or like things that I had to be weary of when I got with an artist, my job would be way easier. And it's, it's not easy because someone from new Orleans comes in and everything I just learned the last week yes. from a New York artist does not apply here. Can you always understand all the slang, like the local slang? Not at first, but I ask, Yeah, yeah. I don't pretend to. Yes. Yes. That's the biggest thing. Yeah, don't yeah, yeah. ever either use a term you're not comfortable with yeah. or, or even try to like, pretend you understand it ask if, if you if there's no time where you say to someone what does that mean they're gonna go oh he said what does that mean like da, da. no one's ever gonna do that they're gonna go oh bro it means this yeah like if you try yeah, to you're just, not from where i'm from how would you know that yeah like, <laughs> of course in atlanta the biggest term right now is cap or no cap and it means like you're lying like a cap is lying i mean it, and basically if someone says like no cap it means like i'm not lying i would never walk into a room and be like yo i swear i sent the files no cap it doesn't sound right coming out of my mouth. It's not for me. I'm not from Atlanta. But I grew up in New York. And trust me, like, my friends say hi to each other. They say, you're. They don't say, yo. They they literally yell, you're. And it's just a New York thing. It's like there's different slang from different places. And if you're not from that place, unless you're around those people all the time, like, don't even pretend you understand what it means. I had, I was in the studio one time with a really, really, like, a producer I'm a big fan of from Atlanta. And he just goes, bro, do you know what J's are? Like when someone said, when he said J's in that song, you know what he's talking about? And I, I was I think in my head, I was like, is he talking about police officers maybe? He said J's at the door was the line. And I was like, J, what is that? Is he talking about a junkie? Oh, I didn't know that. My first reaction was a police officer. I clearly was the exact opposite. I thought they were saying cops at my door, da 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 got to get out of there type shit. He was talking about there's junkies there. I'm serving drugs to junkies. I see. You know what I mean? The whole, the next three lines before and after get switched now in the context because I wasn't aware of a one letter slang term. Yeah. The songs from my favorite artists in Detroit that got me into them, that made me start listening to them, I didn't even understand them until I worked with the artists. Yeah. 
and I loved I love yeah. these songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know every word. Yes, yes, yes. But I don't but know you have every no idea word. What it's talking about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sometimes you know, like general stuff everybody gets, and that's I think the common denominator of the money stuff. Yeah. And you know what that's like though, when when you're a little kid and you hear music, you don't really know what the words mean, but you still love it because totally. you don't know all those words. You totally. know, in 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 everything, you don't know all the words. You don't know what they're talking about. My favorite band was great. Kiss when I was a toddler. All I listened to was Kiss songs. <laughs> it was just the music that spoke to me. It wasn't the words, you know. How did you get? How did you end up getting into Kiss in the '90s? That's a funny time to get into Kiss. My dad's an audiophile. My dad listens. To well, if he's an audiophile, he wouldn't be listening to kids. No, yeah, but I'm just saying he listens to everything. I see. So across my childhood, like my dad would literally play me a Boz Skag song and then play me a Commander Cody song and then play me The Chronic and then a Sheryl Crow song would be on the radio and he would like it. And then he'd play me like uh, Grateful Dead or whatever it was. So, so stuff would come across my plate. And when I heard uh, I Just Want to Rock and Roll All Night as a four-year-old, I was like, this is music. It's great. What a great record that is. <laughs> my two favorite songs that year, because I remember there's a videotape of me like talking about it, are uh, I Just Want to Have Fun, Shale Crow, and uh, All I Want to Do is Rock and Roll All Night by Kiss. I was in a very similar mind space. <laughs> but yeah, like, I don't know, like, but those are anthems, you know, those are for sure. I think yeah. at four years old, like, you that's when you start to recognize a good anthem, yeah. <laughs> But I have to say, like, I grew up with my, I played instruments a lot of my life. So I had to play music that lent itself to instruments, played classic rock and played jam band stuff and fusion stuff and funk and soul. Were you in bands? Yeah, a little bit, but there wasn't that much of a scene for it in Connecticut. I had a, I had a amount of friends on one hand I could count who really played music and did music in their free time. Mm -hmm. It was all sports. Mm -hmm. But uh, my dad was never ironic about liking hip hop. Or like liking what was on the radio. And so like, I remember the thong song. He just thought it had such great production. Like he would always talk about, the, he would talk about the beat of the thong song and not be funny because it's a song about like a kind of bathing suit or kind of underwear. And it's like the, the big ass song of the year. My dad was just like, he just loved the song. And my dad would sing it unironically. And he'd be singing that thong, da, thong, thong, thong. And you're like, this is so dumb. Yeah. But I would see in his face, he's like, he would see me laughing at him and he'd be like, he would just turn to me kind of like, I'm not, I'm not making fun of this song. I like this song. So I had an appreciation via him for the stuff that my friends were listening to and that I had around me all the time as being really good music. So even something that would be a novel to many people that would be a novelty song, if it was well made, it would still be good. It doesn't, totally. it didn't have to be the cool song. Totally. Yeah. But like my dad was listening to West Coast hip hop and listening to current things that were on the radio with me on top of showing me all this other music and I grew up in Connecticut so I had I was seamless I was regionless as far as there was no music coming there still isn't any music coming from where I grew up New York was the closest thing I had yes. and when I was old enough I spent all my time in New York but I really grew up without a core regional that sounds type really music. good though because th that way you're not pigeonholed into totally you know being brainwashed into one sound as being your sound yeah so you you really are free. It's so interesting how the how the the things like in in the moment you probably as a kid would wish everybody played and there was a scene and there were clubs to play in and how come you know people get to do that in other places and I don't get to do that but it really formed who you are now and maybe you wouldn't be the same producer you are today if it was if it wasn't for that. 100%. I think that's the first thing you and I ever talked about. Was it? Yeah, like for when we first talked in your car like I remember just saying, like, I remember growing up and just wishing I had more money and I was and had a bigger friend and had my friend's house and lived in a place where everybody did music oh, and yeah. da da da. da. And now at I just turned 28. Now at 28, I literally would never trade places with anybody. I'm so glad I don't have that that uh obstacle in my mind of like, oh well, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, or this is where I'm from. It's like my metal phase was just as long as my like Leonard Skinner phase, just as long as my Dilla phase. Yeah. You know what I mean? They yeah, all, me too. They, <laughs> me too. that's Same. what I'm saying. They yeah. shared equal parts in my mind. And like, I think a lot of fr my friends, at least now who make a lot of music and who have made music since they were kids, they always have this dichotomy of like, here's the music my dad showed me and my parents showed me and all this old stuff I was put on to. And then here's the music I listened to with my friends. And that's definitely true. Cause that's how you find out about a lot of stuff. But the music I listened to with my friends wasn't written off 
by my dad and like, oh yeah, that's that's what's on the radio now. My dad would hear certain things and be like, Jay Z is really way better than everybody else, huh? You know what I mean? Like he would see, he would understand enough to like really dive into. He really it. loved music, totally. Yeah. And I think that was Most, m- many people as they get older only they only like the music that they liked as a ch- as a as a kid or yeah. a teenager. Yeah, that's sort of the rest of their lives. That's their music. So, so like that, my appreciation's always been that just for everything. It's everything, just like yeah. what you like, you know, and it doesn't matter. You're not from a place that lends itself to anything, so you can like everything yes. from everywhere. Yes. I never had the uh, moment in my career and like my music making life where I got popular doing a specific thing yeah. or a specific sound. It was never like, oh, it's this kid from New York with a, working with all these New York artists and he's got that sound right now. So let's try to put him with some other artists and see if that fits with them. My whole life, it's always been whatever this project is or this person is, I'm that chameleon today. And then tomorrow I'm this. Yes. And that's why I forced myself to learn about all the things that go on. But like a lot of my favorite producers and the biggest producers doing it today have found this land. Like think about Tay Keith. Tay Keith is probably the biggest producer out of Memphis ever at this point. Last year, the amount of singles he had and the amount of number ones and everything, like he's doing everything from Drake to Travis to Beyonce. And he is the most Memphis beat maker you could ever be. It is the most three, six mafia influence you could ever be and he's taken his sound to the nth degree he's beyonce forming her style and her current outlook on what her new music needs to be around this kid's drum patterns and tempos and what he's doing because what he's doing is such a cultural phenomenon right now can you play what um what would have been the tracks that the older tracks he made that inspired these people to want to work with him? yeah this is the first one it's called Shoot by Black Boy JB, also from Memphis. Bet 20 more, I hit the first row. Freaking bitch on go, she gone off the road. And without anything, just listen to a 3 6 Mafia beat right after that. New 3 6 Mafia, featuring A5, Nim JG, Young Buck. It's a Tennessee thing. I gotta stay. Even though in 3-6 Mafia, it's much more of a sample, more soulful vibe. That's always what their stuff was. You can tell that Tay Keith was influenced by extremely on-the-beat, quantized, straight hats, straight kick patterns, sharp-ass snares. And it's the music is very faint compared to how big the drums are. Way more so now yes. with Tay Keith. But even in 3-6 Mafia, it's much more about hearing that hat and that 808 than it is about those strings or any of those samples. Mm-hmm. Or in a Dilla thing or a Boom Bap thing, like you're going to hear what's going on in the sample very up front. Mm-hmm. But Tay Keith is so routed in where he's from, found an artist from where he's from in Block Boy, that that song Shoot just became a phenomenon. And there was a dance that went with it. That dance is now in Fortnite and in every video game and it is a huge thing. It's whenever you like pound your arm forwards and kick your leg back at the same time. You see yeah. everybody always doing it. Little kids do it all the time. That dance was founded by this artist, helped blow up the song. Take Keith made 100% of his beats. The next song that they did after that song, Shoot, which I played, was um, Block Boy and Drake. And let me see just what it's at right now. Yeah, it's at 279 million views on YouTube, The which is Drake getting on the Take Ethan and Block Boy song. And it's like, it's the most regional thing in the world. It's specifically Memphis. All Take Ethan was working on was uh, like artists from where he's from. And then all of a sudden Drake gets on it. It puts eyes onto it in a different way. Then all of a sudden he's doing Travis Scott records featuring Drake, which are amalgamations of three different beats which change how radio sounds it's the first like number one single to ever be that weird with all those different songs and it broke all these records and it all evolved from what he was doing in memphis based on old three six mafia stuff to try to make everyone around him go oh that's hard yeah and now he's it's beyonce yeah it's amazing and there's a lot of stuff you can break all these different types of rap music and all these niche sub genres into but i think the main thing is going to be like if you if you go back to the first iterations of all of it, like we said before, they only had so many tools, so many drum machines and so many things you could get across and really the feel and the bounce and the tempo and those things are what 
dictated now styles that are vastly different and fully formed and evolved. And it all was like, man, we 10 of us got 10 drum machines in 10 parts of the country. We got to make 10 different crowds rock. This one drum machine with this one pattern does not work in half these places. We got to figure out what works here. Yeah. And now like I'm still trying to do that same thing, but I've just got a lot of history that I've got to pay respect to. Beautiful. Cool, man. Thanks to Kenny Beats for breaking down the origins of regional hip hop sounds for us. Be sure to check out next week's episode where we'll hear all that Kenny has been up to since him and Rick last spoke. To see Kenny Beats in action, check out the two seasons of his show, The Cave, that he has up on YouTube, where he sits down with artists and makes a beat specifically tailored to them on the spot. It's incredible. Also, be sure to check out a playlist of songs produced by Kenny Beats that we put together at BrokenRecordPodcast.com. You can follow us on YouTube at YouTube.com slash BrokenRecordPodcast, where you can find extended cuts of new and old episodes, and follow us on Twitter at BrokenRecord. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Martin Gonzalez, Eric Sandler, and Jennifer Sanchez, with engineering help from Nick Chafee, and our executive producer is Mia LaBelle. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. If you like our show, please remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music, based on the Beastie Boys' Brass Monkey, is by today's guest, the incomparable Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond. Peace.